The eyes are the window to your soul. Sure, that's what people say, but as an eye doctor, I actually think our eyes are a window to our brains, our hearts, our thyroids, our kidneys, and our minds. Just based on an eye exam, we can learn so much about someone's health. So in this video, I'm going to mention some key eye findings that can tell us about how our bodies are doing. All of these findings I'll discuss are perceivable with just the naked eye without any fancy medical equipment. So you might want to whip out a mirror to check your eyes as we go along. First is corneal arcus. Corneal arcus are white or gray rings around the edge of the cornea. These rings are actually made up of lipid or fat deposits in the cornea or the transparent outer layer of the eye. They form when these tiny fat and cholesterol particles permeate through our blood vessels and stick to the edge of the cornea. Corneal arcus is actually really common as we get older. Some research studies have shown that the prevalence of corneal arcus is nearly 100% in patients over the age of 80. Now, in patients over 50, the presence of corneal arcus doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong. It's just considered a normal change with aging. But in patients age 40 or younger, or especially in patients 30 and under, the development of arcus is not considered normal, and it's often associated with increased fat or cholesterol in the blood, meaning hyperlipidemia or hypercholesterolemia. And so the development of arcus, particularly in a younger person, may be the first sign someone has of having a lipid disorder that can increase the risk of developing cardiovascular disease like a heart attack or a stroke. So if a young patient comes to see me and I see corneal arcus on exam, I make sure to send them to their primary care provider to receive a lipid panel. Now, the good thing about corneal arcus is that since these fat deposits are in the periphery of your cornea, it doesn't affect your vision. Usually, we just monitor corneal arcus. There's no direct medical or surgical treatments to remove or reduce the appearance of arcus. The next eye finding we'll talk about, xanthelasma, is also related to cholesterol and fat. Xanthelasmas are these yellow, soft deposits of fat under the skin that usually appear around the eyelids. They're typically found on the medial or the nasal side of the upper and lower eyelids. They're made up of white blood cells called macrophages that contain built-up cholesterol and triglycerides. They can occur in patients with normal lipid levels, but they're more common in patients with high cholesterol and are usually found in older adults. Patients with xanthelasma should have a lipid panel done to check their cholesterol and lipid levels, as well as their overall cardiovascular risk factors. Xanthelasmas themselves aren't dangerous and are usually more of a cosmetic concern for patients. If patients are significantly bothered by these, we can remove them surgically, although there is a chance for it coming back, especially if the underlying cholesterol problem isn't addressed. Okay, the next eye finding we'll discuss is when the whites of our eyes turn yellow. This is what we call scleral icterus and is associated with a condition called jaundice, and it could be a sign of an underlying liver condition. Let's take a step back and understand how a liver problem can cause yellowing of our eyes. We all have red blood cells in our bloodstream whose job is to deliver oxygen throughout the body. These red blood cells carry a special protein called hemoglobin, which is the protein that carries oxygen. Our body is constantly creating new blood cells and older ones get broken down by our spleen and liver. The broken down red blood cells and hemoglobin get converted into bilirubin. Bilirubin can get processed by the liver and excreted into our intestines so we can poop it out. So if we have problems in our liver like hepatitis or cirrhosis or even a genetic condition like Gilbert syndrome, which causes the problem in the liver's processing of bilirubin, then we can get a buildup of bilirubin in our bloodstream. That bilirubin can make its way into our eyes and cause them to turn yellow. So if a patient is coming to me with new yellowing of the eyes or scleral icterus and jaundice, I refer them to their primary care doctor right away so they can coordinate care with a GI specialist to evaluate for any liver or bile duct issues. So if you're noticing new jaundice, go see a doctor as soon as possible because you may be developing a condition that can seriously affect your health. Okay, the next signs we'll talk about are signs we see in thyroid eye disease. Now, there are several characteristic eye changes that can be associated with thyroid dysfunction. We can see signs like proptosis or bulging of the eyes, eyelid retraction, or basically the upper eyelid is higher than normal and the lower eyelid is lower than normal, so your eyes look bigger. We can also see conjunctivitis or redness and swelling of the conjunctiva or the pink tissue surrounding the eye. In more severe cases, all that swelling in the muscles and fat in the eye socket can even pinch down on the optic nerve, causing decreased blood supply to the optic nerve and permanent damage to your vision. And it doesn't immediately make sense, right? What does your thyroid have anything to do with your eyes? Well, for some patients, the cause for their thyroid dysfunction is that they have an autoimmune disorder, meaning that their immune system can mistakenly activate and attack their thyroid glands, leading to abnormalities in their thyroid levels. But in patients with autoimmune thyroid problems, the immune system can also mistakenly attack the tissues around the eyes, which can lead to inflammation and swelling of the fat cells the muscle cells in the eye socket or the orbit. This inflammation can lead to the characteristic signs we see in thyroid eye disease, like bulging eyes, big eyes, or even misaligned eyes. So if I walk into a room and I see a patient with these signs, then I'll be sure to ask them if they have a history of thyroid problems. And if they don't know, then I'd recommend for them to get checked out with their primary care doctor as soon as possible. Okay, 
The next sign we'll talk about is called leukocoria, or a white pupil reflection. Normally, when we flash a light into someone's eyes, we expect to see a red reflection come back. You often see these red eyes in photos when the flash hits someone's eyes just right. The reason why the reflection is red is because the overall color of our retina, or the tissue in the back of our eyes that allows us to see, is a pinkish red from all the blood vessels in the retina. But if instead of a red reflection, we see an abnormal white reflection from the pupils, then us eye doctors need to figure out what's going on. I've personally seen a few cases where a pediatrician refers a child to us because the parent notices that in photos, one eye shows up red and the other eye doesn't have that same red reflex or reflection. Then we do the eye exam and lo and behold, there's an ocular problem like a cataract or a retinal condition that we need to treat. Now, there are actually quite a few reasons for what can be causing leukocoria. Leukocoria is most often noticed in children first. So we're usually thinking about pediatric conditions and we want to act quickly because many of these conditions can lead to permanent vision loss if they're not addressed. Probably the number one condition we need to rule out for leukocoria is retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is a rare form of eye cancer that affects young children, and if it isn't treated early, it can not only be vision-threatening, but also life-threatening. Other conditions that can cause leukocoria include congenital cataracts, or basically clouding of the lens inside the eye. The lens is supposed to be clear, but if for whatever reason, perhaps genetics or trauma, if a child has a cataract and that lens is cloudy instead, then light won't pass through the lens and we'll see leukocoria instead of the normal red pupil reflection. Other conditions, particularly retinal conditions like retinal detachments, retinal bleeding, or regular retinal development, these can all also cause leukocoria as well. So this is something we need to rule out. Before we talk about the next eye sign you don't want to miss, I want to tell you about my optimized newsletter. If you want to get the latest science-backed information on how to improve your vision and health delivered straight to your email, you can visit my website at michaelchuamd.com to sign up. Okay, the next eye change we often see as eye doctors are red eyes. There are many different causes of red eyes, including hemorrhage or bleeding, infection, inflammation, or allergy. In the case of subconjunctival hemorrhage or bleeding, we would see some pooled up blood on the front of the eye. It's usually caused by broken small blood vessel in the pink tissue lining the eye called the conjunctiva, and it isn't dangerous. In allergic conjunctivitis, we see red, irritated, dilated blood vessels, and it's often associated with itching and tearing, and may also have other allergy symptoms like runny nose or congestion. These usually improve with antihistamine eye drops like Xatidor or Patidae. If the red eyes are caused by infection, we usually see mucus discharge as well as local swelling. These usually improve with antibiotic treatment. Another really common cause for red eyes are dry eyes. When the eyes become dry, the corneal dryness can trigger local inflammation in the eye, causing swollen blood vessels with eye redness, irritation, a gritty sensation, and pain. There are many different treatments for dry eye depending on the severity of it, but we eye doctors usually start with a moisturizing artificial tear eye drop like Sustain Complete or Retain MGD. Okay, the next eye finding that we eye doctors see are crossing in or out of the eyes basically misalignment of the eyes. That's a condition we call strabismus. Now, there are many reasons why the eyes are not aligning properly, and it can often be a diagnostic challenge for us eye doctors to figure out what's causing someone's strabismus. Sometimes it can be caused by muscle dysfunction or an imbalance in the muscles that control eye movement. Sometimes it could be a problem with the nerves that control the eye muscles. Conditions like strokes, brain tumors, or other neurological conditions can cause new eye crossings, so we need to be particularly mindful to diagnose and treat these conditions quickly because things like brain tumors and strokes can potentially be life-threatening. There's still more conditions like eye or head trauma, a tumor in the orbit or the eye socket, or thyroid eye disease, like we mentioned previously, these are all other possible causes for strabismus. So when we see strabismus, it could be a sign of another underlying problem that we need to work to diagnose as soon as possible. Okay, the next eye finding we see that can be a sign of an underlying problem is nystagmus. Nystagmus is characterized by these involuntary, repetitive eye movements. Sometimes they can be present at birth or congenital, or it can be acquired later in life. Some reasons why a child may have congenital nystagmus include congenital cataracts, congenital retinal diseases, albinism where there's a lack of pigment in the eyes. This can cause vision problems that can lead to nystagmus and aniridia, or basically not having the iris or the colored part of your eye. That can also lead to nystagmus. In older patients, new onset nystagmus may be a sign of an inner ear problem. We all have what's called the vestibular system in our inner ears, which is important for maintaining balance. When there's a problem in the inner ear for maybe inflammation, Meniere's disease, or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV, then there can be a disruption of the normal balance signals that are sent to the brain. The brain tries to compensate for these disorienting balance signals from the inner ear, triggering these rapid involuntary eye movements, or nystagmus, to try to stabilize vision in the presence of abnormal sensory inputs from our inner ears. When the inner ear problem is addressed, then the nystagmus usually resolves. Another common cause for nystagmus in adults are medications or drugs. Certain medications like seizure medications or anti-epileptics can cause nystagmus, but alcohol can cause it too. In fact, 
Checking for horizontal nystagmus is one of the common tests that's performed during field sobriety tests by police officers when they're trying to figure out if you're under the influence of alcohol or not. Other neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis, stroke, or head trauma can also cause nystagmus and are things we need to consider and rule out when we're evaluating a patient with nystagmus. Okay, so we went through a whirlwind review of different eye changes and signs that can tell us a lot about not only your visual health, but also your overall health too. If you notice any of these signs, it's a good idea to get checked out by your eye doctor for a full examination. And if you live in the Los Angeles, Orange County, or Inland Empire area and want to get your eyes checked out, feel free to visit our website or give our phone number a call today. And if you made it this far into the video, that probably means you're really motivated to learn more about different ways to protect your vision and health. You can watch this video here to learn more about how to prevent glaucoma naturally.